All right. Um, so again, just everybody, thanks for joining. Thanks for taking time here today to, to join us here. Um, and today we do have the privilege of having a guest speaker. Uh, we have Dr. Eleni Friligu. And so she is a postdoctoral research associate in uh, psychiatric genetics um, at the institution, uh, Yale uh, School of Medicine, um, and specifically in the t Department of uh, Psychi uh, Psychiatry, sorry. <laughs> And so I won't take up too much more of your time here. I'm going to hand it over to her um, and let her begin sharing with us all this great new knowledge on the research or workbench that she's found. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Eleni, um, and I'm really glad to be talking to you today because uh, I will be sharing my first project in uh, the researcher workbench and in all of us. Um, and, you know, in this process, I've gotten a lot of help and a lot of exchange from this community that the workbench has turned to be. So I'm really glad, you know, to be sharing all these things uh, with you guys today. Um, so for the for my first project in the all of us researcher workbench, I was really interested in seeing how I could um, explore and integrate all those very cool resources that we had. So we had wearable data and also genetic data, but also electronic health records, data on exposures, and et cetera. So I tried to come up with um, with something with a with a topic that you know could possibly um, where it would be useful to integrate all that. So uh, we chose for this for first project to work on uh, investigating the link between heart rate variability, the genetic liability to anxiety, and the role of antidepressants in this relationship by integrating genetic and wearable device data uh, along with electronic health record data. Um, so uh, a, a little bit about me. Um, I come from Greece. I have a medical degree from there. I worked as a resident psychiatrist for a couple of years, but uh, I have decided to pursue uh, my um, residency training in the US. So in that process, I also completed a master's degree in health data analysis, which led me to my postdoctoral research position uh, in psychiatric genomics. And I'm generally interested in psychiatric genomics and how these can be used to, to, to find the common genetic architecture among various psychiatric diseases and to disentangle a little bit the heterogeneity that exists within each uh, distinct psychiatric disease. Um, so I will also tell you a little bit about uh, anxiety disorders. I have included here uh, the five common types of anxiety disorders uh, that are included also in uh, the DSM-5, a generalized anxiety disorder, uh, social anxiety disorders, separation anxiety, specific phobias, as well as panic disorders. Um, and um, in previous classifications, uh, there also used to be uh, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, and as well as PTSD, they also were included uh, within the spectrum of anxiety disorders. And I mentioned mentioned that because also in all of us in the version six of uh, the researcher workbench, this is the classification that we used for our analysis. So in general, um, among this, you know, heterogeneous group of psychiatric disorders, there is a significant degree of diagnostic overlap. Um, and 50%, almost half of the individuals uh, with an anxiety diagnosis fulfill the criteria for at least a second one at the moment of the anxiety diagnosis. So not over, this is not a lifetime. Um, this is not, this does not refer to lifetime diagnosis, but to this point where they fulfill criteria for one anxiety disorder. And also this, this uh, common uh, phenotype also is translated to shared genetic uh, structure of those disorders, and it has been shown in various genome-wide um, genetic studies. Um, it, anxiety disorders are also quite prevalent, with one, one out of five patients in a primary care setting fulfilling criteria for at least one anxiety disorder, um, and uh, with a lifetime prevalence of approximately 34%. 
So one out of three people among us will fulfill criteria for at least one anxiety disorder at some point in their lifetime. Um, however, although it's it's a pretty re uh, you know pretty prevalent group of disorders, however, there still is a significant diagnostic delay um, in anxiety disorders, uh, with a median time from onset of symptoms to diagnosis five point four years. Um, and this this uh, refers to uh, anxiety disorders as a whole. So this leaves us with millions of people, basically, with undiagnosed anxiety that is taking a huge toll on their quality of life. So the question now is, is there any um, patient-related data that is significantly associated with anxiety disorders? And if yes, could we possibly, you know, could we potentially use them in the future to improve our screening diagnostic tools? So the first step is to find those associations. And one really useful um, source of patient-related data that we did have in all of us um, was uh, the wearable data. And in particular, we were interested in this metric called heart rate variability, which basically quantifies the fluctuations of sequential RR intervals. And to explain what this means, I've included this very simplistic example of uh, two ECGs. So, those big spikes, can you see my, my my mouse, the cursor? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, so yeah, those spikes here, they are called the R waves. And the R waves basically are the time, this time point when the, uh, the electric signal reaches the ventricles and they contract. So basically this causes our heart to beat. So those intervals between the R R waves, are between the R waves are called R intervals and they represent the interbeat intervals. So you can see that in this first example, um, there's essentially no difference, uh, no time difference among those R intervals. And this would be, you know, this would equal, there's no difference actually. So this would equal to a heart rate variability of zero. Of course, you know, this is not really realistic, but for the sake of the example, this is what low heart rate variability would look like. And then in the other, in the other uh, ECG, we can see that there, those R intervals uh, vary a little bit, and this would represent higher heart rate variability. It might be a little counterintuitive, but in general, high heart rate variability is the phenotype that is associated with less morbidity and mortality. It's generally, you know, considered to be better, uh, a healthier, you know, thing. And uh, as to the, uh, as far as you know, the the significance of this metric is concerned. In general, heart rate variability is related uh, to autonomic control mechanisms, and when we say autonomic. Control, we mean the, the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems in the heart that are um, mostly regulated by adrenaline, noradrenaline, and acetylcholine. And in general, it has been argued that uh, it quantifies the autonomic system control, uh, autonomic system tone. Um, however, this is not, this is really um, kind of sim a simplistic way to see it. In fact, heart rate variability reflects the complex nonlinear interplay of all the feedback loops, autonomic and non-autonomic, which regulate the sinus node pacemaker activity, and thus our heart rate, according to our body's needs. So heart rate variability um, in general is associated with a lot of factors. Um, sex, age, fitness are some of them, uh, but also it's affected by the circadian rhythm, medication and medical conditions. And we will talk about especially those two in in a few seconds. So um, what is the relationship between anxiety, antidepressants, and heart rate variability? In general, anxiety is associated with decreased heart rate variability. Um, however, antidepressants that are used as a treatment for anxiety are also associated with decreased heart rate variability. So it has been argued in the past that maybe antidepressants are the sole reason that we see this association uh, between anxiety and heart rate variability. Um, and it's it's important to, to uh, tease those two effects apart. If we want to use heart rate variability in the future to explore its clinical significance, 
uh, but also its pathophysiology. So in this study, we asked uh, ourselves three questions. The first is, is there an independent association of anxiety with heart rate variability after accounting for antidepressant use? The second one was, um, does the genetic liability to anxiety have a potential causal effect on this decreased heart rate variability that we see? And the third is, um, you know, we asked which antidepressants are associated with a significant decrease in HRV from the data that we had in the electronic health records. So as you can see, uh, in this case, we have two very strongly correlated exposures, anxiety and antidepressants, affecting our outcome in the same direction. Um, so this relationship is kind of challenging to disentangle. Uh, and this is where genetics comes into the picture because the genetic risk to anxiety um, although it's strongly correlated with the anxiety phenotype, but also with the antidepressant exposure, um, it is it does not have this one-to-one -one correlation where if you have anxiety, you're very, very likely to take antidepressants. In fact, the, the, the genetic risk for anxiety has a normal distribution in the population. Um, and this means that someone with a very high uh, genetic risk for anxiety does not necessarily have anxiety and thus they're not necessarily exposed to antidepressants. And how did we quantify this, this uh, genetic risk to anxiety? We use polygenic risk scores. And polygenic risk scores are basically uh, the additive genetic risk of an individual for a phenotype of interest based on their common risk variants identified by a genome-wide association study. So the first step is to conduct a genome-wide association study where a bunch of cases and controls are genotyped, a large number of cases and controls, in fact, are genotyped. And then we look into um, the, the effects of the common genetic variants to this particular phenotype, so anxiety. Uh, and for our study to answer our questions, this is you know a representation of all the data we used. We first um, sought to calculate those anxiety polygenic risk scores. And for that, we had to, first of all, use a base data set, and that would be the GWAS I was talking about. For that, we used the meta-analysis of three genome-wide association studies that were previously conducted and that are independent uh, from our All of Us cohort. And using METAL, we conducted the meta-analysis, and then using PRSCS, we calculated the polygenic risk scores. We entered those polygenic risk scores in uh, the All of Us Researcher Workbench and using Plink score function, we calculated the anxiety polygenic risk scores for our version six participants of European descent uh, with whole genome sequencing data, Fitbit data, and electronic health record data. And here in this word cloud, you can get a, a picture of um, of the anxiety diagnosis and their frequencies uh, within within all of us. Moving on, we had to calculate heart rate variability. And for that, we focused on the time domain measures and the time domain measures could be short-term measures. So uh, heart rate variability calculated within five or 10 minutes. And those have some particularities. So they only capture circadian rhythms or any information about uh, about activity, uh, about physical activity, I mean. However, the long-term measures are, are kind of, you know, challenging to calculate because we would need a lot of um, a lot of data points for a lot of participants for, you know, maybe, you know, for long longitudinal data. And Fitbit data in all of us kind of solved that problem for us because with wearable devices, we did have access to 24-hour measurements of a large number of partic participants and for a long duration of follow-up for some of them, as you will see. But the problem is that uh, the Fitbit data we have is minute level data. And I was talking about those RR intervals before and within one minute, there's you know 60 to 100 normally, under normal circumstances, um, RR intervals. So how, how did we deal with that? Uh, we calculated of all the long-term heart rate variability metrics, we calculated SDANN. And SDANN is a standard deviation of five-minute heart rate averages over 24 hours. So this can 
be calculated with minute level data. Um, it's highly correlated with SEN, SDNN, which is a very commonly used HRV metric, but also with other time domain and frequency domain metrics. It's generally stable over time in the absence of major clinical events, and it captures the circadian rhythm and autonomic system control. So of course we had to reduce significantly. It's still a lot of data. So this, this would mean that we had 1,440 rows of data and that is the minute level heart data per participant per day. And that's a lot of data. Um, so we tried to reduce as much as possible the number of participants using SQL queries to find, um, to find um, which participants had full 24 hour measurements where European did have full genome sequencing data and of course Fitbit data. And then for those people, we extracted the minute level data and calculated SDA and N. Oh, uh, and then finally, I was talking about those, um, I, I'm, I was talking about daily heart rate variability metrics. So if we wanted to properly control for antidepressant exposure, it was not enough for us to control for life, lifetime exposure. We had to find a way to know whether this participant was exposed to antidepressants on the particular day of the HRV measurement. So we we looked into the prescription data and we looked for, um, for, for participants that had a drug exposure start date time for antidepressant before heart rate variability, the, the day of the heart rate variability measurement, and then uh, a drug exposure end date time after the day of the measurement. Or, had a missing value on the drug exposure end date time. And because this is, you know, this is still, uh, it's still electronic health records and we wanted to control for possible mistakes. Uh, we um, excluded participants that uh, were both using tricyclic antidepressants and SSRIs on the same day, or participants that were seemingly had more than three antidepressant um, our antidepressant prescriptions on the same day. It's not that it never happens in practice, it's just that it rarely happens. As you can see, the numbers are pretty small. So, you know, we we didn't we, we didn't worry a lot about our, our active antidepressant prescription definition. And then we also excluded uh, antidepressants that were prescribed to less than 10 people we, because we thought that, you know, this is a very small sample. So moving on to the results, um, First of all, we had a few challenges um, to overcome when with respect to the SDA and N metric. And those had to do basically uh, with the fact that we didn't have a lot of previous literature on the distribution on this SDA and N metric uh, day by day, because it's kind of hard to um, calculate SDA and N if you don't have access to this sort of longitudinal um, heart rate data. So as you can see, it it has it's normally distributed with a, with a skew to the right, and this is actually um, consistent with the literature regarding other daily heart rate me metrics like mean heart rate or resting heart rate. Um, and then we had a second question to answer. So as I said, we had daily heart rate variability uh, measures, but each participant had a different number of days. Um, of SDNN measurement. And we wanted to know before, you know, calculating, you know, putting them all in the same model, basically, we wanted to know what correlation, if any, there is with, uh, between the number of observations and the um, SDNN value, both the, the daily SDNN value, but also the median SDNN value. We ran both models and they didn't seem to be um, uh, associated. So we proceeded with included, including everyone. As you can see, some participants could have one day of SDNN measurements and some participants had more than 600, which is you know more than a year. So we ended up with 914 people uh, with full day SDNN metrics, whole genome sequencing data, electronic health record data, and you know that had consented as well to electronic health uh, record data release. And 
now we tried to answer our initial questions. So to answer whether there is to whether there is an association between the anxiety polygenic risk and the daily STNN value, we ran generalized linear models, generalized linear mixed models using a person ID as a random effects factor um, to account for these, you know, multiple observations per person. We control for the first 10 within ancestry principal components for sex that we derived from the genetic data in all of us for BMI and uh, for the measurement age in days. And we had for that, yeah. So so yeah, uh, those are the results. You can see, we can see that with respect to age, sex and BMI, uh, they are all results that we were actually expecting. Um, so HRV is ne SDNN is negatively correlated with all three um, variables, but also it's significantly negatively correlated with our anxiety PRS. So then we moved on to control for active antidepressant uh, prescription, and as you can see, it is very strongly um, associated with SDNN. But even controlling for that there still remains a significant association between the anxiety polygenic risk score and uh, our um, SDANN values. So after that, in order to be a little more certain about what we see, and given that SDNN, as I mentioned in the beginning, is affected by many, many factors, um, we wanted to conduct some sensitivity analysis, excluding participants with known conditions that might affect SDANN. Um, and those were major depressive disorder, diabetes, cardiovascular comorbidities, which we grouped. And under this umbrella, we had prior myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, arrhythmias, and beta blocker and calcium channel blocker exposures. Um, so those are the results of our models. They they still, you know, anxiety PRS looks like it's still significantly associated with SDNN, even conducting sensitivity analysis, excluding people with those comorbidities. So then we moved on to look for causality. And of course, as you know, causality in statistics is kind of a, a tricky thing to infer. So we conducted um, a causal inference, genetic causal inference analysis, um, in fact, we use one sample Mendelian randomization, which is an instrumental variable regression. Uh, and it uses anxiety PRS as an instrumental variable, the anxiety phenotype as an exposure, and SDNN as a, a result and a, an outcome. Um, so basically, uh, what what one sample MR says is that if there is a, a significant association of the anxiety PRS with our outcome SDNN, beyond the association that exists between anxiety phenotype and SDNN, then it's potentially because this anxiety PRS has a causal effect on SDNN. Because anxiety PRS pre-existed, um, it was there before the anxiety phenotype and any other potential environmental confounders. Um, so for that, we had to aggregate all, all our daily SDNN metrics uh, into the median. And after conducting the analysis, we found that anxiety seems to have a statistically significant, um, potentially causal uh, effect on the decreased SDNN we see. Uh, and uh, those metrics basically show that our model is fits the data pretty well. Um, so finally, uh, we tried to see uh, in this, you know, in an observational manner, we tried to see uh, the associations of our of the antidepressants within all of us um, with uh, the SDNN value. Oops, sorry. Um, controlling for anxiety PRS this time, and those are the results. Um, Venlafaxine and bupropion seem to be significantly associated with decreased SDNN. We're kind of happy to see that because venlafaxine and bupropion are both in an antidepressant class called SNRIs, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. And as the name suggests, um, they directly affect the autonomic system function. Um, so... 
so yeah so those were the two that that seem to be statistically significantly associated and then we also did the same but uh, this time we aggregated our um our antidepressants in different groups based on mechanism of action and here we can see that they are all they all seem to be negatively associated with SZANN but uh except from this group right here serotonin uh reuptake inhibitor but also antagonists which is for example trazodone and yeah, this is the end of the results of the analysis. So the key take home points are that the anxiety polygenic risk is associated with decreased heart rate variability independently of the effect of antidepressants and comor comorbid conditions. Um, the one sample MR indicated a potential causal effect of anxiety on heart rate variability and SDNN would seem to be associated with some antidepressant sub substances and classes. And of course, this study had several limitations, the first among which was the fact that we focused on European participants of European ancestry due to the lack of you know, powerful anxiety GWSs to calculate the polygenic risk scores for other ancestries. Um, and also, we didn't test the, the other side of the causality. Uh, so does we didn't test the question, does um, SDNN has a potentially causal effect on the anxiety phenotype. This is because the only HRV GWAS that we we know of um, actually uses short term heart rate variability metrics, and we we were kind of hesitant, you know, to as to what the interpretation of of the result would be, because as I said, long term and short term metrics capture slightly different um, aspects of the pathophysiology. Uh, and then lastly, um, with respect to our antidepressant exposure results, uh, it's really, really important to keep in mind that this is an observational study. There's all sorts of um, of prescription bias data, uh, biases that, that could play into our results in the sense that, you know, our results could have uh, the, the prescription patterns could be biased by anxiety severity or other comorbidities. Um, so this is just basically an exploratory um, analysis to suggest, you know, further randomized control trials, um, you know, to, to make sure that what we're saying is correct. Um, yeah, so before um, handing it over to you guys and your questions, I would like to say that we have a preprint. So in case you have any further question or you're interested in reading our article, you can just scan this thing here and um, you can read the article in Meta Archive. And then finally, of course, I would like to thank both my team, which is right here, but also our um, collaborators for Ye from Yale Cardiology and from UCSD. Um, and of course, acknowledge the participation of all of us participants, but also the participants of other um, GWSs. And again, really, really thank uh, the researcher workbench support because you've been amazing. You guys, you really helped us and it's been a very exciting journey. And yeah, that's it. I'm very happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you. That was that was really great. Um, personally, I thought it was very fascinating. Uh, I do know there's a couple of questions that kind of popped up in the chat as we were going. So I think it might be cool to cover those quickly. It looks like one kind of was already answered. Um, and then we can hand it over to the audience. So the first question came through at the beginning from Sophia. And they asked, is this related uh, with heart arrhythmia? And then I think uh, someone else jumped in there and, and answered it. But if you wanted to answer it to yourself. Yeah, sure. So um I'm just reading the answer as well. Um, yeah, so basically this is exactly, so what they say is, so basically heart rate variability refers to the normal sinus node and the sinus node is, you know, the, the normal normal center of the heart that generates heart heart rate. Um, so, so heart rate variability refers to this normal rhythm. And indeed, if you have participants with arrhythmias in there, um, this would increase the heart rate variability that we see. 
Um, so what we did for that was one exclude patients with arrhythmias. It's just I I don't know how I didn't put that in the in the presentation because it's really important. Um, and so we did that. So we excluded people with diagnosed arrhythmias. But also what we know is that SDANN, because it's a 24-hour metric is generally more immune than other short-term met metrics to the random non-sinus non node rhythms that might appear, you know, in a person with not with not without a diagnosed arrhythmia. So I hope this was clear. It looks like gonna... it was. Sophia's giving a thumbs up. So great. Um, the next one came through from Horal. She asked, was the SDA and N values averaged over monitoring period per participant? Yeah, so so the um, so the SDA and N values in in the first model that we run um in the question of the association with with uh, the polygenic risk score, they were daily SDA and N values. So they were not averaged, they were just entered in a generalized mixed model entering participant IDs as a random effects term. Um, but for the uh, the following, so basically for, for the Mendelian randomization, we did we didn't average, but we took the median due to the um, due to the distribution of SDNN. Uh, but yeah, th this is how we handled the values. Great. Um, and then it looks like we did get another one. This may be uh, bringing back the scale a little bit. And uh, Ramit said, first of all, great work. Agreed. Um, could you share a little bit about um, the basics of how you accessed and co-analyzed the heart rate data with genetic data and EHR data? Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to. I think there's a big point in doing that in here. So so first, I because I the heart rate data are like the minute heart rate data in all of us, it's a huge data set. You know, my environments kept crashing and crashing. So what I decided to do was first narrow the participant number as much as possible. So what did we need? We need people with whole genome sequencing, Fitbit data, but also full day measurements. So I use SQL queries to, and then in R, I, I took you know the, the common ground of those people and I ended up with 920 people. So this was the first thing I did. Then I extracted the heart rate variability data and I made basically using R, I made uh, CSV files with daily SDNN values per participant. I was always backing up in the in the um, you know in in the the work cloud. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I I did lose everything at some point and recalculated, but it's fine. So yeah, then I extracted the um, the genetic data for the so I then I created a cohort with people with Fitbit data and whole genome sequencing data, regardless of diagnosis. And I extracted the VCF files in the version six um, from there. And from there I calculated, I, I, I generated B files. And then using Plink, I calculated the anxiety PRS. And then I simply entered in the same model, you know, using R in a CSV file. I just generated basically a CSV file where in one column you have the anxiety PRS, and then in the second column you had the either the daily SDNN values or the median. So it was pretty straightforward, you know, just by creating CSVs and then merging them. That's a yes, short answer. It's like it's helpful, perfect. Um... Looks like Helen put in a question too. He said, just curious, how do you make sure the diagnostic criteria for anxiety disorders are similar across your discovery GWAS and target data? Well, uh, this is an excellent question. Uh, it's so anxiety, anxiety in general is a very heterogene heterogeneous phenotype. And for a clinician, especially, it's kind of painful to <laughs> you analyze all that, you know, in the same in the same model. Um, however, it has been shown. Um, however, has been shown that our first of all, our base data sets they are strongly genetic co genetically correlated with each other. So we used UK Biobank and FinGen. Those two are case control studies, and I did manually check that basically they included 
almost the same uh, anxiety disorders. Uh, and then we had the MVP one, which is a numeric phenotype, which is basically an anxiety score. Um, and although this is kind of, you know, it's kind of tricky to, to say that, you know, I'm going to meta-analyze all of that together, we did calculate the genetic correlation first. We made sure that although they're different phenotypes, the genotype is strongly correlated in order to be able then to meta-analyze our data. And basically, we use that as a common ground to, you know, for, be able to calculate the polygenic risk score in all of us after. So to make sure that in all of us, we were pretty much okay with the phenotype, we run the analysis of the anxiety, the association of the anxiety phenotype as we defined it with the anxiety polygenic risk score that we calculated for the other, from the other GWASs. It was pretty high. And, you know, this is also what we use to say that, yeah, hey, this, this is an actual anxiety polygenic risk score. But that's a, an extremely valid question. It's something that, you know, we really thought about. Do we have any other questions uh, for Alini? Uh, Helen said thank you. So yeah, that was a very well uh, crafted answer. So thanks. But yeah, does anybody else have any questions? Feel free to unmute or you can continue to plug them in the chat and I can read them. I'm sorry, I, I, if I may, I'm Sophia. Uh, I don't know if, if I interrupted <laughs> anyone else. I, I, I'm sorry in advance. Um, I just um, got confused after this last answer. So I'm, um, I'm not a clinician. <laughs> <laughs> just start and I I I my introduction to all of us is more from the teaching front so I work at actually at the library at the medical school uh, at the Yale Medical Library so nice to meet you uh, Lenny and maybe we can meet sometime um, and and uh, yeah so I've been getting my knowledge up about all of us so i still don't um you know i don't know a lot about this uh, data set and one of the things that got me confused right now with your last question was um so your uh, the 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 people that you analyzed for the hrv hrv right um they were the the same subjects that had the genomic data available or you they had yeah so so we used for for the calculation of the prs we used independent an independent data set but then the people that we analyze and all the results i'm showing is the same people so the ah, same people okay. we have their anxiety prs and the SDNN and all of the rest you know antidepressant exposures everything was on the same people Oh, okay. Okay. That, that, that is a relief. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's really the cool thing about all of us as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Great. Great talk, Eleni. Thank you. Hi, Ellen. Um, this is Iran. Um, I have a quick question. So I'm trying to run a, um, uh, genome social instead as well. And, and I use the kind of like the cohort builder building by the um all of us. Um okay. the condition we select um doesn't always come out the correct condition we want to include. Did you run into those uh mm -hmm. issues and do you have to like filter mm -hmm. or like check, make sure the condition you want to include it is actually the condition you um, are interested in? Thanks. Um yeah, thank you for the question. So for, for this study, I didn't have to do that because I only um, extracted genomic data for Fitbit people. And that was pretty straightforward. It, it was just people that had Fitbit data. Um, but for the for an, another study, I have done that, you know, like extracting basically case control data. Um, and yeah, I, I can't I can't say I had I had this problem. No, I I, I can't say I ran into that. I mean, I did have to to look into the exact, you know, the source uh, value um, diagnosis to make sure, you know, they're all I'm all I'm interested in all of them. But yeah, I didn't notice that. Thanks for pointing that out. 
one thing that I, I could maybe mention from our end of being on the tool side of the workbench is um, if you haven't already utilizing the hierarchy chart when it comes to uh, these concepts so that, or for example, your conditions, um, so that way you can see what falls under a parent condition. Um, and then you may not have to go searching as far and see like what you truly are looping in when you click a parent concept for existence, uh, for example, like uh, malignant neoplastic um, disease or something like that, you're gonna you're gonna grab a handful of child codes with that. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I did notice that some concept, like when you click it, it like automatically like check some other concepts. Um, they have like overlapping. Um, so I'm just trying to uh, figure out how to like remove things that I don't want to include because um, sometimes include like. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're that. seeing is when you click and then it, and then it automatically selects other ones. It's because you clicked a, you were selecting a parent concept. So then it will automatically grab the rest of its child concepts that fall underneath it in that hierarchy. Okay, thanks. And actually, since I have you here as well, um, I was wondering, like, so, for example, if we have the participant, but sometimes they don't always have the um, whole epsilon sequence data in the all of us, but my understanding is the all of us do have their um, samples. Um, is it possible how how to like request samples to kind of like run a um, so that we can do a, a next gen sequence? Sure. So we don't necessarily take a um, request uh, basis for getting more samples, but what I can say is uh, around twice a year biannually uh, we do two data releases, and so with each of these data releases, the number of uh, data counts uh, typically goes up. So we'll see an increase in, in genomic samples. We even see an increase in um, health record uh, data points and stuff like that. So um, as we do those data releases, those numbers will increase. So maybe, um, you know, some participants who hadn't had their genomic data entered in yet will have it in the next release once they get those samples in and processed. I see. So just re increase re-increase the data like after the release. Got yeah. it. Thanks. Yeah. Do we have any other questions for Alini? If not, I'll um, just reiterate all the things that kind of came through the chat too is a uh, great job. It was it was really insightful. Um I think yeah even Haral said great presentation. Um so thank you for taking some time out of your day and, and coming forward with this. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, thank you for all the collaboration and the wonderful help uh, that we've gotten. And, yeah, it, it's been really exciting to work in, in all of us. Yeah, so thanks for having me. <laughs> of course. Um, if there are no other questions, I'll pause for a second to see if there are. And if they're not, then... We can go ahead and give you guys a few minutes back for the day. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. Thanks again, uh, Eleni, for, for contributing Bye. your time and your presentation. Bye, everyone. Thank you.